Hello everybody, this is Tommy's Outdoors 71. And today our guest is Secretary General of the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation, Dr. David Scallon. In the podcast, we talk about three main subjects that are of great interest, not only for hunters, but also for all people who care about the environment. First of all, we talk about the phasing out of lead in hunting, shooting, and also fishing. That's something that we talk about the podcast many times before, and this time we had an opportunity to hear firsthand how European Union works and how those cogs are turning and where that legislation is at the moment and what is the future. Secondly, we talked about biodiversity or biodiversity loss more precisely, and again, what the European Union is doing with that regard and how hunters' organizations uh, are involved in biodiversity improvement and how that whole area intersects with farming and with uh, farming policies in the EU. And finally, we touched on rewilding. And again, uh, what the rewilding is, how it ties into biodiversity improvement, where it is in European Union landscape, in air quotes. And also, we discussed what hunters can do to get involved and not only improve the natural environment and uh, biodiversity, but also to improve social perception and social acceptance of hunting. So regardless whether you're hunter or not hunter, I think you will find this episode very interesting. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Dr. David Scallon. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to have you. You know, you're one of the guests that I was uh, really anticipating and really wanted to have you on the podcast for for quite a while um, because I'm very interested in in what Face does and uh, you know talk about in general about hunting in Europe. But before we get into any of these, uh, how's the coot going and its nest? <laughs> Uh, the coot is going well. Um, let's say I haven't had the chance to keep an eye on it in the last uh, mm -hmm. few days due to my workload. But um, yeah, let's say it's uh, uh, it's for those who don't know, you were you were uh, reporting on on Twitter the progress of coot's nest and how how it was building a nest and doing all this thing, and I found it very enjoyable. You know, each day having an update. You know, day twenty one, the coot is you know incorporated some plastic into it, which is unfortunate, <laughs> but it, it was it was nice to see his progress. So you don't see it now. You you don't you know you're not there where where the nest is. Yeah, no, not at the moment. Let's say I've moved location a bit, and I'm uh, mm -hmm. haven't had the chance to keep an eye on it. But I'll get back to it uh, probably on Friday. So. Oh, okay, okay. We'll be waiting for the for the update. So, David, um, let's let's talk about uh, Face. And uh, for those listeners who don't know, Face is a, uh, a European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. And I think that the acronym is in French, right? Fédération, Association, something, something. Yes, um, and you are Secretary General of uh, Face. Yes. How did that happen? How, how one becomes Secretary General of European Hunting Organization? <laughs> well, it's a job um, that I absolutely love. It's a job I say to people I would do it for free. Um, mm, I bet. Because it's, um, you know, to be leading an organization like FACE that's been around for 40 years, that is, let's say, the primary organization uh, in Brussels, dealing with hunting and conservation issues, yeah. um, you know, is a real privilege. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we had our previous secretary general had, uh, had moved on and um, the post opened and I had been uh, working with FACE for a number of years and I was 
let's say, uh, moving up the ladder. I was senior conservation manager before I took the position as secretary general. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a position that wasn't very new to me. Um, and it's, let's say, it's things are progressing very well in face at the moment. And um, as is the policy environment is moving um, as quickly as ever with the new parliamentary term. Yeah, well, and that's that's you know so okay. So one last question, just to set the scene for for uh, our listeners, how the phase is structured because um, it's not like this is like an association of regional organizations or or organizations on the country level, right? Yes. So it's it's a federation of national hunting associations, and our membership is the National Hunting Associations in 37 countries in Europe. And with that, we are the voice of our community of 7 million hunters in Europe. Right. So individual hunters uh, are cannot become members of, of FACE. That's so to say, correct. So to speak. Yeah. yeah. So our, our, mm -hmm. our membership is open to countries that are uh, either members of the EU or members of the Council of Europe. And you'll see we have the EU 27, but we also have uh, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, uh, Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, etc., etc. Gotcha. And is it like a limit that there's only one organization from the country, or or do you allow more than one from the country? Yes. Yeah, so the the in the vast majority of cases, you have one national hunting association, and that is the one face member in Italy. And in Ireland, there is a Face Italy and a Face Ireland, where there is more than one national hunting association representing um, hunters. So they have a an umbrella structure to affiliate to to Face. Okay, gotcha. And you know, I was wondering if if that if that um, structure doesn't make uh, things more difficult, uh, perhaps because. From the perspective where I'm, where I'm sitting, you know, I would like to see, uh, maybe naively, I would like to see organizations that European organizations that that um, that hunters can be members and be kind of proud of something like a, a backcountry hunters and anglers in in the U.S., where you know. Uh, Hunters on the field, uh, the, the folks you know who are going to shoot deer with guns, uh, feel associated with that organization and kind of feel that that organization have their back. While in face, I, I feel like it it's often perceived as like a you know very distant uh, bureaucratic EU organization that is not you know not on the forefront of of uh, just everyday hunter. Is that is that difficult? Um, it's 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 not difficult, but let's say you're correct. Um, most grassroots hunters uh, wouldn't know face. Um, mm -hmm. For our 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 members, um, they see us as a as a key you know watchdog, as a kind of an insurance policy. But the engagement of Brussels is 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 important. I mean. We estimate that about 80% of the rules affecting hunting and conservation at national level are coming from Brussels or the international level. Um, and it's a difficult environment. There's, there's a lot of um, European NGOs and there's a lot of agencies and think tanks in Brussels. Um, and it's, it's, it's an important place to have a strong voice. I mean, and the Secretariat is, we consist of 12, 13 staff. Um, and FACE has been in existence for, for 40 years. So our day-to-day -day job is following everything that can affect hunting and conservation at that level. Um, you know, the real job of representing hunters at national level is for the national hunting associations. Um, and our primary target audience when we communicate and when we work. I mean, it's, it's the EU institutions, it's the European Commission, the European Parliament, uh, other partner stakeholders in Brussels and the Brussels media. Uh, we rarely direct our communications at the grassroots hunters uh, or, or at society. And we would love to be in a position to do that. And we have a, let's say we have a vision to be 
you know, to have a big communications team where we can do that. Um, but let's say for the moment, we're really engaged at that level. Um, and our members are, are very active in our day-to-day -day work. We have, we have several working groups. Um, you know, they're constantly engaged in, in policy uh, development within FACE, and we're constantly communicating back to them. So our members, national hunting associations, are very familiar with us. But in many cases, the grassroots hunters uh, wouldn't know FACE. And, and that's normal because of how we're structured and how we communicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so it seems like uh, you're okay with that. You you don't see it as an issue at least at the moment. Uh, it it works well because you're focusing on um, working with it within the structures of of uh, European Union. Really, that's that's what I'm taking. Yes, yeah, that's our real, let's say, design and purpose for the moment. But of course, we'd we'd like to have a have a have a big communications team where we can, you know start talking to society, uh, start talking to hunters, uh, non-hunters, um, promoting um, uh, hunting and its conservation role, its socioeconomic role, its cultural role, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That's a and do you find that sometimes, you know, the, when I when I ask whether it's difficult, uh, maybe, uh, you know, what I meant really is like, uh, obviously each of these regional organizations, they have their, their own... Um, let's say opinions as well and uh i'm just wondering if if the message that you're sending is not getting diluted or uh passed you know differently for different member states member organizations and you know you you you're reading your email and you you're just like oh damn it's not not what it <laughs> what you're supposed to say or or you know something along these lines because those communications lines are not not direct is is that an issue uh no um we are um let's say surprisingly very well coordinated within face and on most topics um uh you know it's it's not an issue that members have different concerns or different views and face has taken positions on 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 certain topics in the past that have the stamp of of face and its members so all of Europe's national hunting associations. Uh, sometimes it's very easy to develop a position. Um, sometimes it's more challenging uh, to develop a position. Um, we're working on a position, uh, revising our position on ammunition, and that's a, that's a tough task at the moment, uh, Well, mainly because there's a lot happening uh, at the Brussels level with regard to restricting lead shot over wetlands and a, a total ban on all lead and all ammunition coming down the pipeline. Um, but we always find a way, um, and we always have done in the past, to, you know, to be able to, to adopt a position, you know, that's stamped by the entire face membership. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a, you know, it's, it's a very healthy process to go through that. Um, you know, we, we, we have to bounce around documents within working groups, put them to our members, put them to our board. Yeah, it's it's not a small task, I I I bet. Um, so you you actually made a, a nice segue into into one of the other subjects I want to discuss with you, which is uh, restrictions of on on lead. And um, in the past, I I made a couple of uh, YouTube videos uh, related to that, and I had a. Um, uh, head of uh, National Regional Association of uh, Game Councils uh, in Ireland, who is a member of FACE, like Irish part of FACE, discussing that subject. And so now I can I can ask you these questions directly and and hear it like straight from from Brussels, straight from UE. How does the situation with uh, lead shots developing? We have two files on the table. We have, um, in 2015, the European Commission asked uh, one of its agencies, the European Chemicals Agency, uh, to prepare a restriction on lead shot over wetlands. And 23 countries um, in the European Union had already phased out lead shot over wetlands, and, and FACE had taken a supportive position back in 2010 on this. Um, initially, we weren't 
very concerned about this. Um, but as the uh, proposal developed, let's say, within the European Chemicals Agency, and particularly when it came to the European Commission, uh, they published their first proposal, which was supposed to be based on the opinion of the European Chemicals Agency last October. Um, and then we realized at that point um, that this is becoming very complex and this is, as it stands, not an understandable and workable proposal for hunters in the field. Um, as I said, it was 2015 when the first request to produce this proposal um, happened. Right, five so, years ago. Had it have been, um, you know, a, 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 let's say a pragmatic approach by the European Commission, um, this would have been, this could have been done and dusted in in, in law by now, uh, particularly if they let member states uh, define what is a wetland. But it's got much more complex because uh, the Commission has added buffer zones, and it's very tricky to apply a buffer zone at EU level around every wetland. And the definition of a wetland, from our understanding, includes all water standing still, temporary or permanent. And when you apply the definition they're proposing, let's say from a legal perspective, because this will become a regulation, uh, even after a good shower of rain and you have a puddle in a field, that will constitute a wetland. So member states aren't in a position to map wetlands. Or if they attempt to do this, they would have to remap wetlands after every shower of rain. Um, so that's, 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 that's a real challenge. And there's also a proposal to ban possession of lead shot uh, when you're wetland shooting. And that's really tricky because in most cases on a typical day's rough shooting um, or small game hunting, you will cross over a wetland, especially with the current definition they're using. Um, so that's, that's, that's really challenging. And the other point, um, European Chemicals Agency recommended a three-year transition period. And the transition period is mainly applicable for countries that have not yet phased out lead shot over wetlands. Um, but the European Commission reduced that substantially. And I mean, even a country like Denmark that has phased out all lead shot, I mean, they would even agree that you need, you need a, an adequate transition period. I mean, it, for countries that haven't done this, you need about five years. There's a lot that needs to be done in terms of shotguns and current use. They may need to be, uh, you know, checked, proofed, tested, um, adapted, or modified. Or hunters may need to purchase new shotguns, and that's a that's a big, let's say, that's a socioeconomic impact on hunters. But they need a suitable time for transition, and the Commission reduced that back to. Um, you know, it was something like 18 months. Um, you know, this was supposed to be the easy one to get over the line, but it's turning out to be very complex. And it's now in its third, uh, we're, we're, we're waiting for the Commission's third revision for the next uh, EU REACH committee meeting. It's, it, this falls under the REACH regulation, which is a piece of chemicals legislation. And how how do you is there's there's you know many questions that I have uh, obviously uh, UK who is you know I, I think not part of the EU now um, they they suggested the uh, kind of like a voluntary phasing out of lead major shooting organizations which was you know mixed mixed reception but everything is going that direction so overall uh, you think it's going to happen and now the uh, efforts are directed not so much to block this, but to make it, you know, work and n minimize the impact of uh, for for hunters in the field, mm. right? Well, I mean, the the first point there's a, there's a lot of diversity in Europe. I mean, hunting is very diverse. I mean, there's a lot of different hunting activities in 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 let's say different different contexts and different settings, and and that's you know that's one of the strengths of hunting. Um, so this is it's, a, it's much more challenging in some countries. Um, the level of risk is different in some countries, um, and countries have taken, uh, let's say, uh, different approaches. Well, there's different regulatory approaches. Um, you have three countries: Denmark, Netherlands, and part of Belgium have phased out all lead shot, but 
There's 23 other countries that have faced out lead shot for hunting over wetlands. And in most cases, laws have been designed in accordance with national conditions and national circumstances with, in line with the level of risk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's happening now is um, last, uh, last July, the European Commission wrote to the European Chemicals Agency and said, prepare a restriction proposal on all lead in all ammunition for hunting, sport shooting, target shooting, uh, including all lead and fishing weights, and uh, prepare your proposal. And, uh, you know, it is up to you as an agency, European Chemicals Agency, to decide whether a full restriction is required or not. Now, the way in which the European Chemicals Agency is, is, is structured and, and, and designed under the REACH regulation, uh, my view is they can only propose a full restriction. And this is going to be a real challenge uh, because the European Chemicals Agency is a very interesting machine. Um, you know, there's many within our membership feel that um, is there going to be a fair trial for lead and ammunition? This is a very complex topic. There's different uses of lead with different risk elements. You have the environmental aspect, you have the human health aspect. Uh, but ECA is designed in a way where, where I say there's a lot of concern that there will be one conclusion we're not really concerned about the level of risk. We just want to ban lead everywhere. Uh, and they have a risk assessment committee, and that committee may say that. And they have a socioeconomic assessment committee, which is an important committee to uh, look into the socioeconomic impacts of a full ban uh, on lead and ammunition. And again, it's 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 complex because um, you know you have. Uh, uh, you have alternatives for 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 some rifle calibers over six millimeter, so over a, over a 0.243. Um, but you really there's a lack in uh, economically feasible and tested alternatives for rifle ammunition for all of those calibers below that. There's genuine problems about uh, well target shooting, but competitive target shooting, um, you know, with rimfire rifles, uh, and even with shotguns, it's bringing a huge new scale um, so we have uh, many hunters have uh, that hunt water birds you know have adapted either by modifying or or, or or changing or buying new shotguns but it's going to bring in a whole new aspect in terms of the socioeconomics for for many hunters and particularly where you have older hunters uh, with a shotgun uh, they may not feel it's 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 suitable uh, they may not even be willing to test it. Uh, if they do test it, there may be a, you know, a new economic element um, that they may or may not engage in. Um, so it's a challenge, and there, there's, there, you know, there's different concerns about what could the impacts be on on uh, loss of hunter numbers in, in, in some countries. Yeah, there's also like a vintage vintage rifles and vintage uh, firearms uh, that, that are definitely not... Uh suitable to do for steel shots or or steel or or you know ammunition made of tungsten or or copper or whatever yeah there are i mean you've you've, you've short firearms uh, you've black powder muzzle loaders you there's there, you have different categories of firearms where where you cannot their transition to non-lead ammunition um so it's 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 going to be a very complex task um it's one of the unique cases um, where Brussels will directly regulate Europe's 7 million hunters. Um, so, I mean, this is a serious piece of work for FACE, for FACE members um, to engage in. I mean, there's some, there's, you know, there's, there's going to be some serious questions asked, obviously, when we see the report from the European Chemicals Agency that's due before October. Uh, and, and, and then that process. And again, the, let's say the request will be that this is that, that there is a this can be done in a, in a proportionate way and that the complexities and the socioeconomic um, uh, impacts are, 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 are carefully considered. Um, but this is it's a huge program of work ahead of us um, for all, um, you know, and, and it's, it's a challenge when. When you try to harmonize, I mean, with the lead shed over wetlands restriction, I mean, there's nothing wrong with 23 countries designing their own regulations in accordance with national conditions. 
And the major problem we see with the wetlands restriction is this approach to harmonization. Uh, it's really difficult, and that's why it's so challenging to get this, what people were thinking was a simple restriction on lead shot over wetlands, over the line. I mean, the current proposal, it's very difficult for the current proposal to work, very difficult for hunters to know if they're on a wetland or not. It's very vague from a legal perspective. It's going to be difficult for enforcement officers to know if a hunter is on a wetland or not. This issue of possession of lead shot is, is, a, is, is a real challenge. Um, you know, and again, and applying buffer zones over all water, and if water is defined as a puddle in a dry field after a shower of rain, uh, it's wide open for just total confusion. And the EU has adopted this approach called better regulation. So law should be understandable to the end users. And, and again, this is this is the challenge. It's it's you know, it's as it stands, it's absolutely not understandable. It's exactly yeah, the opposite correct. right now. Yeah, yeah. And like if you if you uh you know uh, have to look into the uh you know glass ball and say like what how it's going to pan out? How do you think it's going to pan out? Um or or how would you like this to pan out in in the end? Because I think that one thing is for sure that that eventually lead will be banned uh right california already done that they they banned use of lead in all form of, forms of shooting so this is coming um so w would you say that you know any any resistance is really doesn't make sense and in fact it is good from the environmental standpoint anyway um and you know, so how do you think it's going to play out well, in the end? Let's say for the for the wet for the restriction on lead shot over wetlands, we would hope that there is a workable and understandable regulation at EU level. Uh, that's a first step. Um, yeah, whether we like it or not, the 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 European Commission has taken a view, um, also with the European Chemicals Agency, that they don't like lead and they don't want lead in the future. Um, now, there is a lot of lead in use in the EU. I mean, batteries is the big player. You have a lot of lead used in, const in the construction industry. And actually, the use of lead in, in ammunition is about 2 or 3%. It's, it's, it's incredibly small. Um, it's going to be a very challenging future for the continued use of lead and ammunition based on the, the approach the European Commission has taken with its request to the European Chemicals Agency. Um, we just hope that process will be a fair process where you can look at lead <clears throat> and the view of many FACE members is phasing out lead shot over wetlands uh, has been done in most countries. Uh, and it's looking at the wider impacts of lead in the environment. And in many cases, the risk is actually, they would say the risk is quite low. Um, and in areas where you, where you, where you can have high risk, uh, you may have, for example, cases, uh, let's take the Alps, for example, um, where you may have some small uh, in, in vulture populations or, or golden eagle. Uh, if you have cases there, um, that they are ingesting the grolic of animals shot with lead. I mean, you can. There are ways of managing that risk uh, at that, let's say, at that local or regional level. Um, and then there's the, the, the discussion because reach is, is about the environment and human health, and the discussion about lead and human health um, is a. Uh, it's it's very interesting. Seven. Several national food safety agencies have taken a view on this, and they argue that you can continue to use lead in ammunition, but you need to manage it with careful butchery. And they provide guidance on that in terms of cutting around the wound channel. Uh, they identify certain groups of people. If you're thinking of becoming pregnant or you are pregnant, you should avoid gay meat shot with lead. Um, but for other categories, they say it's okay with careful butchery. So the view of many is that um that outside of wetlands uh, the risk is low and the risk to human health can be controlled uh, now how the european chemicals agency approaches this um 
is going to be very interesting. Uh, as I said, you know, one, one concern within our membership is that uh, the agency can only say one thing, ban lead everywhere as wide as possible uh, within the scope uh, that's, that's proposed. And that's going to be, that's going to create a little bit of a nuclear bomb um, with, with, within the face membership. And um, this is always a problem when you're trying to do like a one size fits all solution, especially when you're talking about, you know, 7 million people and all the different use cases. It's, it's impossible to have a one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have, I mean, the EU does an excellent job. I mean, you know, face was born when the birds directive was, 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 uh, you know, was was born you know there's 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 the habitats directive i mean i mean with the eu nature laws i mean the directives they set a good framework um for laws to be designed at national level in accordance with the broader framework and today we have the eu biodiversity strategy being launched in a farm to fork initiative and there's a lot of very very good policies for nature okay there's a whole lot of issues around implementation and poor implementation and and biodiversity is doing very bad at EU level. Uh, there needs to be much better integration with the EU's common agricultural policy. That is, let's say, the main driver of biodiversity loss. So we need to find a way for that policy to, in, you know, to 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 deliver for biodiversity. Certainly, while it's being reformed. But going back to the issue, yes, it's very hard. I mean, the EU has no direct competence on hunting. Uh, it indirectly regulates hunting uh, through directives and other regulations, etc. Um, but now you're getting to a phase where for the first time in FACE's existence in 40 years, there's going to be a direct a proposal to regulate all hunters in terms of the ammunition they use. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a real challenge. And it's, yeah, it's harmonization. It's like the wetlands restriction. Um, many of our members will say there's nothing wrong with our government designing our rules in accordance with national conditions. And, every, and, and there's so much diversity in how national governments have phased out lead shot over wetlands. Some have taken a species-only approach. Some have taken a habitat approach. Some have taken both. And laws have been designed in accordance with national conditions. And, and uh, you're right, the challenge when you try to harmonize something like this, uh, that's when it becomes a monster. And that's when people start talking about, is this proposal fit for purpose or not? And you surely you you also heard uh, voices or opinions that um, this has nothing to do with lead. This is uh, just continues a pressure on firearms use and hunting in general. And this is really what it's all about, not about lead or you know. You surely heard those those uh, those those opinions. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean you can see that's that. Um that concern and that frustration exists in, in, in a number of countries. I mean, let's say from us, we're, we're looking at this through a lens at the European Commission and the European Chemicals Agency. And, and, and they're trying to deal with this um, through the REACH regulation, which sets out this entire procedure of, 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 of uh, producing an opinion and it going through a risk assessment committee, a socioeconomic assessment committee. Um, from where we look at it, um, we're seeing a very, very hard, very strong approach to attempting to regulate lead and ammunition. Um, you know, from 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 our view, uh, looking just at these two institutions, um, you know, that's how we see it. Um, but of course, I mean, when you have uh, discussions about hunting, can be quite emotive. Um, at national level, in some countries there's great social acceptance of hunting. In some other countries, there's there's there are small but very vocal anti-hunting organizations, and I guess their goal is to cling on to anything that they see as a way to restrict hunting on a on a point of principle, not so much on a point of is this an activity that's uh, that's sustainable, economic, uh, economically, ecologically, etc. But but here's another opportunity to ban hunting, and and they're coming at it from that respect, and uh, you know it's 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 um, it's a tough one, particularly in countries where the debate about hunting, um, you know, is about is, is is more of a fundamental discussion about about I don't like hunting. Full stop. Um, 
you know. And there's been when ethics and morale is getting getting involved in that conversation. Uh, yes. Right? What are the what what are those countries? Do you do, would you be comfortable in sharing what are the countries that uh, hunting is under most pressure right now in the EU? I would say, I would say if you look at the Nordic countries, there's very high social acceptance towards hunting. Uh, you know, it's really featured around uh, you know local communities and the sharing of game meat. Um, if you go further south in countries like Italy, where I mean, we work well with BirdLife International in Europe. Uh, but some bird life partners are just are just full stop opposed to hunting, whether it's ecologically sustainable or not. They will be opposed to it. Um, but I mean, you you see segments of this in in many countries. Um, you know, in the United Kingdom, for example, um, uh, the bird life partner there, RSPB, has you know I think up on a million members. Um, but there's other, let's say, small groups like Wild Justice that that have been established, really, to try to attack hunting activities from a legal perspective. Um, you know, they've tried to challenge the, uh, their general license uh, for the control of, uh, of, of crows and pigeons. Um, you know, they're trying to challenge, uh, you know, the release of game birds uh, on or near Nature at 2000 sites. Um, you know, and this it's, it's, is every European country is different, you know, socially, culturally, socioeconomically, et cetera. Um, but, Let's say you see segments in 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 many countries, um, and again in some countries there's in countries like you know Estonia is a country where there is they, they manage to coexist extremely well, you know with their large carnivores and um, you, you know the, the the hunting community is you know is uh, not really under under any pressure. And then go to Germany when the wolf has returned and is doing very well. Um, or even uh, even countries like Sweden, where there is so much conflict, and there is you know uh, quite green environmental NGOs. And there's the farming community, there's the hunting community, and there's a huge amount of time being consumed on 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 human wolf conflicts. Um, so even you you know even if you take a country like Sweden that has very high social acceptance towards hunting, I mean there's still there's a lot of time being consumed on trying to coexist with the wolf, for for example. Yes. So it's a uh, but I'm taking from you that there is you you don't feel like there's a, like a one overarching conspiracy that is trying to uh, put your taps on hunting through this regulation. It's it's just fragmented. That's all. Yeah, it's fragmented. Um, you know, I understand where the where the, where, the, where the concerns are, are coming from, but from our level, this is really uh, you know the EU the EU's approach to regulating lead in 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 ammunition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I think that's uh, we we spend a lot of time on on lead shots uh, and lead in general, and um, I'm certainly going to be I, I'm going to keep reporting on the on the podcast and on my YouTube platform about progress and what's going on, and especially that this issue, like you mentioned yourself, will uh, affect uh, anglers at some point. Um, so so we're going to leave it at that. Now let's uh, pivot to another big subject that you already mentioned, and that's uh, biodiversity, biodiversity laws, and um, obviously hunting and hunters are um, at least should be a big part of that because all hunters would like to have a lot of uh, animals, uh, healthy ecosystems, and and you know woods full of game. Um, so. Can you give us uh, a little bit of update of what what FACE is engaged in uh, on that regard with, with biodiversity uh, improvement, let's say? Yeah, there's two. So there's a big trend and there's, there's a big problem we're facing, and that's the problem of biodiversity loss. Um, you know, and many NGOs are calling this a biodiversity crisis and indeed a climate crisis. Um, what we're seeing is a decline in biodiversity, particularly on farmlands. This is important for hunting because small game populations are declining and we're losing hunting opportunities for small game. So your species like the, the gray partridge, uh, the brown hare and the pheasant. Uh, on the other hand, the way in which farming has changed, uh, land use has changed, it's become much more intensive. The way in which the climate has changed in terms of warmer winters in recent years, ungulate populations are doing extremely well. 
So, and this brings a, an associated conflict and a real onus on the hunting community to be effective at wildlife management. Um, countries like uh, Germany, I mean, they're shooting up on a million roe deer a year. Uh, a lot of wild boar, I mean, in Spain and Italy, I think they're shooting close to a million wild boar each year. Um, but we need to address, let's say, the main drivers of biodiversity loss. And the intensification of, of agriculture has been the main driver. So we need to find a way. I mean, we need an agricultural policy that is supportive of our farmers, you know, that is that is paying for the production of good quality food, but it's also paying for the other goods and services that society needs, clean air, clean water, uh, biodiversity, etc. Uh, the European hunting community is making a very uh, substantial contribution to the conservation of biodiversity. We have a biodiversity manifesto. Uh, you should have a look at this, biodiversitymanifesto.com. Each year we publish a report. We gather projects from throughout Europe. And we have, uh, I think we have over 430 projects now. Uh, and they're related. They, these are, these are hunting-related conservation projects. And this is really the tip of the iceberg. But we're, we're working to quantify and qualify the contribution of the hunting community uh, to conservation. And this is projects where, you know, the hun hun hunters are engaged in, in creating and managing habitats for, for species like partridge and pheasant. Uh, where they're engaged in predator management in spring and summer to improve breeding productivity of ground nesting birds. They're engaged in monitoring uh, biodiversity counting birds in spring and autumn to ensure uh, harvest is sustainable. Um, you know, they're, they're And these are like a country level uh, initiatives. So, so they're, they're like, a, you know, grassroots hunters. They will need to engage on the country level. Yes, they're they're engaging uh, well, really at the level at, at at the hunters level. So they're 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 engaging right at the local level. Some of these projects are are big. They're EU life funded projects. They're 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 quite substantial. But some of these projects are where you have a group of hunters coming together, working in conjunction uh, with landowners, and putting in place really good um, you know conservation measures for huntable species. Um, but in a lot of these projects, you have multiple benefits for, for other wildlife. Um, and, you know, t as I said, today, it's the release of the EU biodiversity strategy. Our fifth biodiversity manifesto report has, uh, we have focused that around the implementation of hunters uh, to the current biodiversity strategy from 2010 to 2020. And really, we can say, you know, hunters have been doing their bit. Uh, hunters have implemented the EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, but let's say at, a, at, a, at, a, at an EU level, it's been an absolute failure. Um, you know, oh. we have failed to meet our targets for, for the conservation of biodiversity. And, uh, and that's why we need uh, a serious level of ambition today. By, by, by saying we, who, who's, who's we? You mean face or the EU? Uh, the EU. I mean, the EU is, is, is setting targets and it needs to set ambitious targets for, for restoration. Um, you know, it's going to set some targets for protected areas, uh, but it needs to set some targets in terms of, you know, I mean, percentages of, 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 of habitats in particular. We've had an overly focused approach on species protection that hasn't worked. The approach to protected areas in Nature 2000, I mean, it's been at most a very you know, a, a significant mapping exercise, but there's been no real implementation yet. Um, so we really need to focus on we need, what's doing badly. We need, a, we need objective ecological criteria. And really, if you look at the habitats protected by the Habitats Directive, and it's called a Habitats Directive and, you know, the English term for, for a reason, a habitats, uh, you know, protected by the Directive are in terrible shape. And we had a round of reporting six years ago, you know, and it was something like one in six are, are, are only in favorable condition. And the latest round of reporting by member states, I mean, it's even worse. So we need to, see, we need to start focusing on, on, on habitat action plans. We, we need to start addressing uh, habit, the habitat problems. And our single focus on, on species protection only has been incredibly time consuming. And it hasn't delivered the results for, for the conservation of biodiversity. Um, you know, the protected area approach is good. I mean, there's targets for extending this, but really we need other 
uh, other approaches uh, to conservation outside of protected areas. I would imagine that this is even 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 tougher than the lead issue because obviously, and even you mentioned here, farming is a big player in that area. And I, I, you know, even from uh, what I read uh, and, and watch and listen to various podcasts, the I can see like an enormous conflict, really, and tension between farming community and, um, you know, I'm looking for a, for a right term, but but people who care about biodiversity and, and restoration and conservation. Uh, this is just an enormous, you know, conflict as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, there's, there's, there's growing frustration, let's say, within the environmental NGO community. There's growing frustration about the failure of the common agricultural policy to deliver for biodiversity. Um, yes. And, you know, it's, 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 it's incredibly hot at the moment because within the European Parliament... Um, European Commission has produced its proposal on what the next common agricultural policy should look like. The Environment Committee uh, has, has, has made some, some amendments to that, and the Agricultural Committee in the European Parliament has made some amendments. And, and I, I guess it's, it's, it's frustrating that this frustration exists. Uh, actually, there was a survey uh, on CAP uh, a number of years ago in advance of the current reform, and most farmers also want the CAP to do more for the environment. Uh, so in effect, we're all on the same page. So the next common agricultural policy, I mean, okay, you must pay farmers for producing food, but farmers must be paid. Um, and this must be linked to conditionality uh, for producing these other goods and services that we need, uh, or else we've gone too far in the biodiversity problem. If we don't get this reform of the common agricultural policy right, we're in serious trouble because we'll probably go to a stage where we cannot return farmland biodiversity uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. So I guess there's, there's a serious uh, expectation. Um, and uh, let's say we need a, a, a common agricultural policy uh, that can deliver. And it's not, it shouldn't be seen as, as, as being negative to farmers, you know. Yeah, but it often is, right? It it it, of, it often is. Like I I feel like often uh, when you mention anything, um, you know, as, especially when you talk about rewilding or you know reintroduction of species and stuff like that, uh, there is a lot of pushback from from farmers or far, farming community, understandably so. Um, and yeah, it's incredibly tough. It's incredibly tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our, our our take on this. I mean, many hunters are also farmers. In some countries, you can have a third or more of the hunters are are, 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 are farmers. You know, and, yes. and and many are engaging yes. themselves. Uh, many hunters have been at the forefront of creating agri environmental measures for for a species like gray partridge. Many hunters are are actively engaged. They're working with farmers. They're helping farmers deliver results based locally led agri environmental schemes in Ireland as we speak. The the Hen Harrier project is a very successful one. But I, I think we if we get to this stage where we're it's a, you know we we're we're taking this you know results based approach and we have some conditionality linked in where we have um you know, BirdLife International has, has been quite active in this. They call it a space for nature. But we need a certain percentage. You know, the scientists say you need 10%. Uh, the Environment Committee said 7%. I mean, really, you need a minimum of 5% uh, nature on every farm. For some farmers, they don't need to do anything. Uh, extensive livestock farmers, you know, on the hills of the west of Ireland or in the Alpine area, they have enough space for nature. And they, they need to be rewarded because... We need a, we need that we, we need a future for farming in, in these areas that are difficult. You know they call them marginal land from a from an agricultural perspective, but this is where the high nature values is where you have the the farming that is essential for the conservation of biodiversity. And without farming land abandonment, you have another raft of problems. So, so you know farming systems in Europe are are quite different. There's not much common about the common agricultural policy actually, but we need to find a way. You know, to have to, to support farming systems, especially those that can deliver for biodiversity. But even on your intensive arable farm in the middle of Germany, 
um, you know, there are current measures linked to greening. They're not as effective as they shouldn't be. So as they should be. So we need um, we need the next cap with some conditionality that can deliver for farmland biodiversity. I mean, that's good for nature. That's that's what we want as as a hunting community. Without healthy biodiversity, we you, you don't have oppor- good opportunities for for hunting. Exactly. Listen, what's your take on um, movement of rewilding? I, and I, I, I purposely using that word, and I know good and well that that word may be uh, controversial for some. But in general, it, it, it's it's to me, it's very much linked with biodiversity. You know, when you are reintroducing species, and you know that were you know pushed to extinction or locally extinct, and um, is that something like what do do you do you, do you have a view on that or do face have a view on that and, and engage in any projects uh, that could be labeled as rewilding I mean we're we're, we're frequently approached by um, by let's say ideas and initiatives with regard to re- rewilding and let's say if rewilding is done I mean it's it's really where we're often battling around the terminology I mean there's a pure purist ecological approach a kind of a non-intervention management and and we can have big spaces for rewilding in europe i mean that's not really realistic uh where you know we're in such a you know heavily human dominated and human used landscape we don't have these spaces for for you know for 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 let's say pure ecological processes and in fact where you have most of the good nature i mean it's a combination of 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 natural and human processes, you know, you have extensive livestock farming systems that are working to produce the types of habitats that are there. <clears throat> I see approaches to, you know, rewild the uplands. Um, you know, that's a challenge from a legal perspective because you have habitats that are designated under the Nature of 2000 network, uh, where member states have a legal obligation to to maintain and ensure favorable status of these habitats and. And it's not ideal for, for for landscape scale shifts. You know, there's 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 legal challenges there. <clears throat> I think where rewilding will be, uh, you know, successful. I've seen it. It's just uh, you know, parts of the west of Ireland. It's just been used as a brand, almost like the Wild Atlantic Way, to make a place sound more appealing. Uh, but there is place for rewilding. Um, but it's not the pure non-intervention. Uh, management and you know if you take an area you know non-intervention I mean I mean what if it's clogged up with um, you know with invasive alien species or what if there's too many ungulates etc etc um, you know when, when we, we, we haven't enough space for from my view is what kind of pure purest um, you know uh, yeah I know I know what you mean just 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 leave it to nature bro leave it to nature <laughs> yeah. That's that's not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think we yeah we 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 need to be realistic. Um, rewilding means different things to different groups, um, but I think there is scope for projects where you can work with existing uh, you know land use systems, whether the forestry or farming, uh, you know local hunters, local communities, and I I think there is scope for some for for some serious support for let's call it rewilding, um, and that can be good for for biodiversity but it must be done in a way that's in accordance that's that's workable with 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 the current um, land use systems and that sets some you know some some realistic goals and objectives for 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 conservation and those that let's say landowners and land managers you know they need to be part of that they need to be you know it can't come top down it needs to be they need to feel ownership of this and then you need to find ways that they can be, you know, supported accordingly, uh, if it requires a change from what they've been doing. So I, 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 you know, I think I'm, we're, we're, I think there's some serious scope for approaches like this, um, but they must, they, they must be pragmatic, realistic. They must have the support of local communities. Um, you know, there's there's different ways to 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 achieve that, and there's different ways to approach that, and there's different you know financial mechanisms that that can help. You know, and this is part of like we're gonna be wrapping this this up, but just for just to you know end, um, I think that uh, part of you know the, obviously the hunting is, and I think you agree with that that hunting in 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 general is under pressure um, and. Uh, hunters recruitment is going down and uh, uh, 
acceptance of hunting is also going down, unfortunately. And my my point that I'm that I made many times on the on the podcast is that uh, hunters should be more engaged in the in the projects like biodiversity improvements or rewilding or because uh, in my view they're bringing this pragmatic approach to the table uh you know they're they're like the sensible middle like on one on one end uh i i don't think that anyone would say like oh you know let's bring a bunch of uh, wolf and wild boar to ireland and cut them loose and you know nature will take its course but at the same time they are hunters are people who would like to see um uh, diverse ecosystem and and be able to interact with it um so would you have any advice for for hunters um across the uh, across the europe really um how to engage and how to you know on one on one end work towards uh improving the habitat improving the biodiversity and on the other hand improving the perception and so 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 to say pr of hunting yeah i i think i mean what hunters need to do is i mean keep up the good work i mean let's say the role that they play just if you take the management of europe's ungulate populations you know wild boar and deer is is substantial i mean a major role in conflict reduction with the farming community a major contribution to the conservation of biodiversity at the local level with you know with in conjunction with with farmers uh, hunters can get active i mean many of them have very strong national hunting associations you know with with a lot of staff that are very focused on on policy development and calling for better uh you know land use policy for 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 conservation so engage with your national hunting association but also tell your politicians tell those that are elected you know regionally or nationally or tell your MEPs that you know if you just take one thing we want a farming policy in Europe that delivers for biodiversity conservation i mean each hunter can get active politically on that. They may they don't have to get into the detail, um, but that would be one 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 serious way. I mean, our, our national hunting associations are engaging with with agricultural ministries. I mean, they're 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 calling for this, but that there needs to be more of a grassroots local local call. If they have to pick one policy, it's the common agricultural policy, and that needs to be better for biodiversity. Um, we've seen, I mean, even in countries like the Netherlands, where where hunting is sometimes seen as being quite restricted. Um, the National Hunting Association has done major work in improving social support for hunting. There was a total lack of knowledge, and it's done that through the promotion of game meat. And they have a, an application available where if anyone wants game meat in the Netherlands, you know, they can click a button and they can be put in contact with, with the hunter. And generally... Seriously? Yeah, and in, in wow. countries, I mean... In the Nordic countries where they've where they've surveyed, and also in the Netherlands, you know, where, where they've surveyed society with 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 respect to the views on, on on hunting, you know, most people support hunting, but you have that five percent on the left and five percent on the right, but most people can be the majority in society can be convinced. Um, you know, they just need more information. I think often one of the best ways is offer them some game meat. Um, you know, if it's coming from a, they're coming from a, you know, super abundant populations of, of, of deer or wild boar. Um, and also I think, I think countries can sell their contribution to conservation much more. This is what we're trying to do with their biodiversity manifesto. But, you know, as you said, hunters have been widely recognized as being valuable partners. Um, you know, the commission is constantly saying this with respect to the nature of 2000 network. It's good to hear that because that, that I don't think I don't think that that's the message that is uh, heard too often. How much hunters are recognized as a, as a partners and and um, you know and maybe this is because of the you know like you, like you said the vocal minorities that are that are most heard. Yeah, ab absolutely, and that's that's normally. I mean, if you if you go and ask society what you think of hunting, most people don't have have an opinion. I, I don't really have a view on that, um, but you have a vocal minority that's quite vocal and um that's not my that that's not my that's not my experience though uh i i, I and maybe this is you know i'm for sure i'm biased but i think that majority of people ask about hunting a lot surprisingly a lot of them have a strong opinions knowing very little so maybe that's an educational aspect that we're missing here yeah i mean 
uh, I, I guess again it goes back to the diversity of of, of Europe. Um, you know, where you have very high social acceptance in, in in northern countries, and then it's more challenging. Uh, let's say in the south. I'm being very general. It's not as simple as that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there there's there's also some scope for for education, absolutely. And many of our members have great projects where they're in schools, they're bringing school children out, uh, you know, into the forest. Uh, I was visiting our Danish member. They have a fabulous project. They take kids out and they show them a roe deer and they go through the whole butchering process and, you know, they cook the meat afterwards. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It shows that connection to where food, where food comes from, from forest to fork, let's say. Exactly, exactly. And and surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, how uh, making that connection between hunting and, and food is, is really something that um, opens up uh, people's mind. Um, listen, David, it's been great talking with you. Um, is there like a one message you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, I mean, I would say think about if, if you're a hunter listening to this, or even if you're a non-hunter, we need to think about where you want to be in 20 years. Um, how do you want hunting to look like in 20 years' time? How do you want the environment to look like in 20 years' time? Uh, do you want a, a healthy you know, countryside rich in biodiversity? And if that's what you want, you know, help your National Hunting Association, you know, uh, engage with your MEPs. Um, and I think the main issue, I mean, we are, we, we are serious partners when it comes to the conservation of biodiversity, but I think we need to get more active politically uh, in, 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 in calling for uh, the conservation of biodiversity, which integrates, you know, sustainable use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's the one message. Let's get active. Let's get active in promoting what we do in terms of the benefits of hunting. Uh, and let's get more active politically in calling for a, for a healthy European countryside in the future. Thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.